good. Good to go? I see a hand. Okay, there's a thumbs up. Well, good morning, everyone. It is um, a privilege to be back in front of you. It's been a while since I've been in the auditorium. Hopefully, Kevin explained that he's going to be out uh, for the month of June. And uh, he wanted to have his study. I think he's in 1 Timothy, I believe. Uh, he wanted to have that study un uninterrupted, so he would uh, pick that up when he returns. So for the next four weeks uh, during the month of June, we'll be uh, in the study of the book of Ruth, four-week series. Now, if you, if you have a one-year Bible, it's a, a Bible that divides it up into daily readings, um, usually around Mother's Day, uh, the structured readings, uh, usually it's around Mother's Day, the book of Ruth comes up to, for reading. Uh, a few weeks ago, almost fittingly, the, uh, the book of Ruth came up around Mother's Day. And this book has been the subject of, of many Mother's Day sermons and I'll have to admit that for the longest time that's how I viewed it. But it's really more than that. There have been all kinds of books and DVDs and, and commentaries and sermon series. I think there's even a movie from around 1960 called The Story of Ruth. I watched a little bit of it here a few weeks ago. It just happened to be on and I saw a little bit of it. And of course, Hollywood takes their dramatic license, but it was, it was okay. It's easy to skip through this short book and label it as a Mother's Day type book between the adventures of the judges to the escapades of King Saul and King David in First and Second Samuel. But during the reading of the book of Ruth, maybe you, like I, will consider things you never really considered before. The very first sentence in the very first verse, in the very first chapter of Ruth, kind of sets the important context for the book. These words tell us a lot. In the days when the judges ruled. Now what do we know about the days that the judges ruled? Well, during the period of the judges in Israel, if you read the, 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 the book, there's a lot of uh, adventurous tales. There are uh, uh, all kinds of characters and, and stories involved. And you would think it would be a time of stability. It would be a time of, of harmony and, and peace and normalcy. There would be societal order. But that wasn't the case. It was a very dangerous time in Israel. Judges uh, chapter 17, verse 6, and Judges chapter 21, verse 25, and, and, and other areas specifically says, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Few rules, few norms. Everyone did as they saw fit. The rich and powerful got more powerful. The weak and oppressed became more weak and oppressed. And the downtrodden were shoved aside. Downtrodden, in many cases, including widows. So it's against this backdrop of, of chaos and, and disorder and societal uh, strife that the story of Ruth takes place. And we'll see in Ruth that ordinary people living ordinary lives or trying to live ordinary lives will experience extraordinary human pain. But through their suffering, they will produce extraordinary results because God will use them for His purposes. 
So, in understanding and setting the context for the book of Ruth, you have to understand that you can't look at the story from a human standpoint. Because if you do, it's pretty unlikely that Ruth would be chosen to live the role that she lived. Hollywood probably couldn't write a better script. There's tragedy, there's human suffering, there's drama, there's overcoming difficulty against all the odds. And in the end, there's victory for the human spirit. But it's not a Hollywood script. It's a story about faith and loyalty. It's a story about responsibility and the love of a woman who played a direct part in the Messiah story. And in some ways, the, the title of the book is, is misleading. I guess the, those who uh, collated the, the Bible titled the, the, some of the books, I don't know, but one could easily argue that Ruth is one of the three main characters because you have your mother-in-law, Naomi, and her future husband, Boaz. And in chapter 2, Ruth, in chapters 1 and then towards the end of 1, in chapter 2, Ruth takes the initiative. Chapter 3, Naomi takes the initiative. And in chapter 4, Boaz takes the initiative. So they're all central characters in this. And some even argue that the book centers more around Naomi than it does Ruth because she was able to eloquently state the problem to be addressed. In, uh, we'll read here in just a minute, but in chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, she said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The, Al the Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. And again, in, towards the end of the, of the book, in chapter 4, Naomi somewhat overshadows her daughter-in-law Ruth when Ruth's son Obed is born. Obed being the grandfather of King David. But another sense, none of them, none of them are the central character. The central character in this book is God. The implication is that God is watching over His people. God will provide a way for His people. And He brings this to pass. And He brings good to a situation that was very bad. The book of Ruth is a book about God. And it's a book about His plan to redeem His people. That's what the book of Ruth is about. So in this chapter 1, it's mainly a description of basically headed to Moab and back. Beginning in verses 1 through 5, we talked about the judges' rule. There was a famine in the land. A man from Bethlehem, uh, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a little while in the country of Moab. There was a, there was a famine. Times were very, very bad. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. And they were Epaphrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was with, left without her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpha and the other Ruth. And after they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to aid of his people by providing food for them, 
she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you. Go back to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you and to your people. But Naomi said, No, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who could be your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old and another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would they wait until they grew up? Would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it's more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. You go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave. You, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, if, be it ever so severely, if death separates you and me. Then Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, and she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem, and when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred up because of them. And the woman explained, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she said. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me, and the Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, and arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. So the scene for this story begins in Moab. Moab is down here across the Dead Sea. There uh, currently are, we're living in Bethlehem, but there is a famine, so they need to go and find food and, you know, sustenance. Um, it's kind of on a high plateau. There's really two routes to get there. It's about 30 to 60 miles. Um, and it's south of the uh, Arnon River. If you remember the, uh, when the uh, tribes were uh, taking over the Promised Land, uh, the tribe of Reuben and Gad and Manasseh asked if they could remain east of the Jordan River. That was their... Uh, allotment, and then Manasseh got a portion uh, just to the west of the uh, Jordan River, but if you remember, they wanted uh, to stay east of the Jordan River, not cross over into the Promised Land, because they liked the, um, the pasture lands there for their, their livestock. They had a lot of livestock. And the agreement was with Moses that, yes, you can have your allotment of land here, but you have to go fight and help conquer the remainder of the, uh, the promised land. And of course, we know the story of Lot. Lot was uh, Abraham's uh, nephew. Lot lived in Sodom. And his uh, son-in-laws, our future son-in-laws, however you, uh, whatever translation uh, that, that you have, some... some uh, translated differently, but it's either his son-in-laws or future son-in-laws, they're killed in Sodom and when God uh, destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So afterward, uh, Lot, now minus his wife, um, he and his daughters lived in a cave after the destruction of, of Sodom. And in an effort to preserve their family line, the girls got him drunk and they became pregnant by Lot. Each daughter gave him a son. 
The youngest daughter's son was named Ben-Ami, and the, he was the father of the Ammonites. And the oldest daughter gave birth to a son and named him Moab. And he became the father of the Moabites. And that's the land in which they're going here. Um, the terrain is very rugged and it's steep. And this trip is estimated to take seven to ten days just, just to get there. It had been easier going because she had her husband and two sons with her, but going back, it's just her and Ruth. She's a widow. Ruth is a widow. And they have no one else to help them. But Bethlehem, which is their hometown, awaits them. Bethlehem being the hometown of both King David and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a, it, it's a city that is represented by um, the power of the Messiah. The Messiah comes through uh, Bethlehem. It's prophesied that the Messiah will come through Bethlehem. But in this story, at least eventually, or initially, Bethlehem represents famine, and it represents difficulty and hunger and pain. And some, um, some scholars even believe that the reason that Elimelech and his two sons died is because they were not obedient. They were not justified in making this, this move. Um, some scholars believe that they were being punished for leaving the land of Israel and going to a foreign pagan land that did not worship God Jehovah. I don't know if that is that accurate at all, but some believe that they were punished for leaving their promised home land and the two sons marrying Moabite women. Um, in Deuteronomy, God forbade the Israelites to marry foreigners, not necessarily Moabites, as we'll see here in a bit, but Deuteronomy specifically says, no Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants may enter into the assembly of the Lord, not even to the tenth generation. So they were considered pagans, they were considered outcasts, they were considered... Um, contrary to everything that God Jehovah was. So that's why there is this concern with them going to the land of Moab. Now we don't know if, how much of that is, is fact or conjecture, but we do know that in this instance, God chose to work His plans and His will through a Moabite woman a Moabite woman named Ruth. We'll talk about that a little more here in a little bit. Uh, e even though that Bethlehem was the key to the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah, it was not a happy place at this point. So they're driven from home by famine. Uh, Elimelech's family settles in Moab. And then after 10 years and husband and two sons dying, they're headed back. Naomi initially doesn't want her daughter-in-laws uh, daughter to come with her. Um, perhaps she knew that they would be outcasts in the land of Israel. They would not be treated well. Widows were not treated well at all anyway. It was going to be a tough life for Naomi going back as a widow. But they're driven from home. Moab, father of the uh, Moabites, this pagan land. But the two countries of the Ammonites and the Moabites also at times had good relationships 
with Israel. There was constant fighting between the uh, dynasties of, of Saul, the kingship of Saul. There was constant fighting uh, with the, the kingship of David with the Moabites. One of the judges, Ehud, conquered the uh, Moabites, subdued them for 80 years. That's in Judges chapter 3. But other times, there was a friendly, more of an accepting relationship with each other. In this instance, they allowed um, Elimelech and his family to come in from Israel. But it wouldn't be until the, uh, the death of King Ahab later on that Moab would, um, I guess, finally and, and forever remove the yoke of, of, uh, of Israel being controlling of them. But back to the story. In Moab, the three males die. It's going to be a tough road to hoe. She return, Naomi returns to Bethlehem, and she's going to face the prospects of hardship and deprivation and sorrow. Probably going to have to beg for everything she could get because she was a widow. And as... Often the case today, unfortunately, widows are not always treated respectfully and properly, and they're not treated um, with uh, their initial uh, needs in mind, same way with in, in Israel. But I can only imagine Naomi, if we go back to the... Uh, um, first slide here. Naomi said, why, why me, Lord? Why is this happening to me? I mean, best we can tell, Naomi didn't do anything. But now she's lost her husband and two sons. She's lost any hope to be supported. Because in those days, the head of the household provided all the support. Period. End of story. But here she was. But these words are also different from the, the uh, perspective of Ruth. Imagine what Ruth is thinking in all this. These words, you know, why me, Lord, are words of dread and defeat and grief and hardship. But as we see the story unfold, and they, uh, Ruth's going to know the, the history of Israel and the religion, she's probably wondering, why me, Lord? Why am I involved in this story? Wouldn't you think that the better story would be there would be uh, someone from Bethlehem, from the tribe of Judah, that would... Uh, or, or a woman from the tribe of Judah, she would be better to, uh, to be in the direct lineage of the Messiah. But no. It is God and God alone who decides how He wants to work His purposes. So <clears throat> together they're going to face the realities of widowhood together. And I want to redeem Orpha here a little bit, even though she did go back, she did not want to leave uh, Naomi either, even though her life would be much more difficult if she had accompanied Naomi, um, she didn't want to, to leave her. Some may have always thought otherwise, that she abandoned Naomi, she didn't. But of all people, Ruth would seem to be the least likely to be part of this story and the least likely for God to carry out His purposes. I mean, after all, Ruth was not an Israelite. 
Some believe she may have converted. Um, we have no indication that she did other than the statement in uh, verse uh, 16 of chapter 1, your God will be my God. Seems to indicate that she may have practiced or followed um, Jewish religion somewhat. But being who she was, a Moabite, she would be excluded from the assembly. But above all, she was dedicated to Naomi. Sure seems like it would fit better with the narrative of the story if a little, little tidier if all this had just happened all within Israel and within the tribe of Judah and within uh, Bethlehem. But our ways are not God's ways. Ruth was a woman. During this time and culture, women were powerless. And they, along with their children, were basically considered household property. They had no rights. They had nothing other than what was given to them through the household. That's why Naomi was so um, distraught. Because she knew coming back as a widow, she would have nothing. She says, don't call me Naomi, call me bitter. Which is Mara, which is bitter. She said, I have nothing anymore. Ruth's facing the same situation, but the problem is Ruth is not even an Israelite. Ruth is from the pagan nation of Moab. Ruth was a widow. And again, widows during this time were powerless. They were neglected, they were cheated, they were mistreated. Even in Jesus' days, remember, he, he would get uh, very angry and he would, uh, he would call out the Pharisees because they were ripping off, cheating the widows. Same during this period. They were mistreated, powerless, shunned, forgotten by society. And even though during the period of, of drought and famine, they would be even more shoved to the side as everybody was trying to get what they could in a period of famine. But God always uses His ways and God uses His purposes to not only demonstrate His power and majesty, but to carry out His plans. God sent Elijah to Zarephath to a widow's house whose demise probably and plight was probably inevitably certain. But God intervened. She was poor. But God intervened. Ruth was poor. Naomi was poor. How are they going to do anything? How are they going to provide for themselves? Well, basically, what they could do about their only option was to go glean in the fields. Um, in Leviticus, yeah, Leviticus chapter 23. God told Moses, and given, giving him the law, he said, uh, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. Gleaning is the act of collecting what's left over after the professional harvesters have come through. These fields were commercially harvested. And as we'll read in, in succeeding chapters, the, this act of, of gleaning that God specified in Leviticus is going to be the way in which 
Ruth will be introduced to her future husband, who is the grand, who will be the grandfather of King David. It is through this very act that God prescribed in Leviticus is how they meet, in essence. Some ancient cultures even prescribed this as a form of, of welfare, but it was also dangerous. The commercial harvesters weren't the best lot always. It could be rough, and, and uh, as we'll see, you know, Boaz, when he figures out who Ruth is, says, you know, stay in my field. Um, I've, told, I've told the harvesters they better leave you alone, but stay in my field. It's dangerous especially for a widow. But this process of God providing for foreigners to take, over, take the leftover crops will play a role in how these two will really eventually meet. Ruth had been released by her mother-in-law. Her mother-in-law said, you, you know, don't come with me. You don't owe me anything. I want you to stay here in Moab, marry again. I can't give you any, another son to marry. And if, even if I could, if I could remarry and have another son, how many years would it be before he could even marry? It was her right to leave. It was her right to return to her people. But Ruth believed in verse 16 that your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And if you had told Ruth at the end of the story that she would marry again, that she would bear a son, and that son would be in the direct lineage to the Messiah, she must have wondered, why me, Lord? Naomi from a standpoint of this is just so hard to take. Why is this happening to me? But Naomi probably, or uh, Ruth probably, in a sense of wonderment and amazement, is why is this happening with me? I'm, I'm a powerless widow, a foreigner from a foreign nation, a nation that you sometimes are at war with. Why me, Lord? Now, speaking of the, the marriage of the, the son, two sons to the Moabite uh, women, this was not specifically forbidden in the law of Moses at the early period of it. But there were severe restrictions against the Moabite descendants that were prescribed later. Of course, we, all, we, we know in Genesis chapter 19 that the Moabites, as we talked about, were descendants of Lot. And they, they accepted and they worshipped a, uh, a deity, Chemosh. That was their God. It wasn't God Jehovah. It wasn't the Lord God Jehovah. It was Chemosh. And as we said, they were a perpetual enemy of Israel. But there were times that, that they did at least get along. Once when David was... Um, uh, fleeing from King Saul. King Saul was trying to kill David. I guess he was uh, King David at the time as well because he had been anointed. But, but Saul's chasing David, trying to kill David. And David flees and uh, took his parents and they were cordially received in Moab. That's in uh, 1 Samuel. But however, in general, God uh, directed that His people uh, totally destroy and not associate with the nations around you. He was concerned that if they didn't drive out everyone, if they didn't um, subdue and destroy the nations around them, that they'd be led astray. And He was right. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, God told Moses, uh, when the Lord your God brings you into the land you're entering to possess, 
and drives out many nations, the Hittites, Gergesites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, seven nations larger and stronger than you. And when the Lord God has delivered them and you have defeated them, you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them. Show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and quickly destroy you. And this is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in the fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be His people and His treasured possession. God knew what would happen, but a woman from one of those nations is going to be brought into this story and will have a son who will have a son who will have a son who will be King David. And we know the lineage from there. God knew what would happen if His people would intermarry. He knew what would happen. They'd be led astray and worship other gods. And that's another strike against Ruth. When she comes back, she's from a foreign nation. She's from a pagan nation. She's going to be shunned. She, she's not even allowed in the assembly. But God uses her. You know, the great uh, restorer, Nehemiah, um, in his, in his uh, account, Nehemiah chapter 13, he saw that the people of Judah had intermarried. They had married uh, women from Ashdod and Ammon and Moab. And he said, half the children spoke the language of one of these other nations and didn't even know how to speak the language of Judah. So he rebuked them and called curses down on them and beat them and pulled out their hair. Made them take an oath in God's name to not do this, to not give your daughters to marriage to their, in marriage to their sons. Do not take their daughters in marriage for your sons. Was it not because of the marriages like those that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? You see, there was this concern about intermingling with the, the foreign nations around them. I mean, Ezra, um, Ezra was probably even stronger than Nehemiah. He, in uh, Ezra chapter uh, 10, he was praying and, and he was confessing and weeping and bowing down before the house of God. A very large assembly of men and women and children gathered in front of him from Israel. And they all wept bitterly. We've trespassed against our God. We've taken pagan wives from the peoples in the land. Yet, now there is hope in Israel in spite of this. Let us make a covenant of, with our God to put away these wives and, and to not follow other gods. And Ezra the priest stood up and he said, You've been unfaithful. You've married foreign women and you've added to Israel's guilt. Now honor the Lord your God. He's the God of your ancestors. And do His will. And separate yourselves from the peoples around you. So given all this, with all the opposition to the Moabites, Ruth the Moabitess, given her exposure to the culture and the religion, she surely knew what was going on here in Jewish society. She knew, um, may or may not have converted, but we know she said, your God will be my God. So she had to say, why me, Lord? She asked the question in uh, 
in chapter 2, when she's talking to uh, Boaz, when Boaz is being kind to her, and she says, why have I found favor? Well, that's a good question. We'd probably all be asking, why? Why am I chosen to do this? Well, why not, Ruth? Because that's who God said he would use. God said so. That's why. God often uses people that we would consider to be the least likely. God will use people that if you or I were, were involved, we'd probably say no. I mean, do you really think that we would choose uh, Abraham? He's old. Would we choose Gideon? He was, he was timid and somewhat unbelieving. What about Rahab? She was a prostitute. God used her in Jericho. Peter, Martha, Mary, all of these characters, are they ones we would choose to carry out God's purposes? Probably not. But God used them all for His purposes. What about Paul? When he was Saul, he did everything in his power to destroy the church. Yet God redeemed him and used him for His purposes. Just as God was going to redeem this situation where you have two uh, widows one Jewish, one non-Jewish, God's going to use them and redeem His plan through them. So we're reminded in the book of Ruth that no matter how dark and dreary and difficult and problematic life is, God will use people for His purposes. And if God can use Ruth... He can use any of us. That's the backdrop of the book of Ruth. Is God is going to use someone we wouldn't expect to carry out His purposes. Next week, we'll consider another character in this story. Naomi. We'll pick up with her in uh, chapter 2. She's kind of the... Uh, catalyst behind this Ruth and Boaz meeting that takes place and she's, she's going to, to carry out a very important part in this, uh, this entire uh, story. So next week we'll walk a mile in Naomi's shoes. Thank you.